listen, before we even get to like what you saw on the ice and some of the guys were out there, let's get to more from the coach because uh, it was the first time Rebus and I were joking yesterday. You know, it was sort of a slow day about to go like, <laughs> I'd do anything just for a Maurice press conference today. So uh, outside of that, I know we talked about Nate Bolio's health. I mean, uh, he spoke for a while. What, uh, what were some of the topics that uh, Maurice touched on in the first visit with uh, the Winnipeg media? Yeah, Hassan, I think the big thing that stood out from the uh, 23 minutes and change from Paul Maurice was the uh, the hint at the stylistic changes that are to come for the Winnipeg Jets. And uh, we've talked about this a lot as well. With that revamped blue line and with the play, you know, guys like Nate Schmidt and Brendan Dillon, they will add some size, but they also have that, you know, skating ability, puck moving ability that will allow the Jets to be a lot more aggressive in, in terms of their style of play. So, Paul Maurice touched on it. Uh, this isn't the green light go for the uh, you know the forwards to totally abandon the defensive commitment that they've had to have the last couple of years where the defense uh, core was a little bit thinner, if you will. But they'll be able to be more aggressive. And I think you'll see more pinching from the Winnipeg Jets because you have those forwards that are now a little bit more you know conscientious of uh, you know the 200-foot game that is required. I think their neutral zone will look a lot different and their defensive zone coverage will be a lot different as well, Huss. I think there'll be a lot lot more aggressive in zone as well so that is what really stood out to me from you know the Paul Maurice comment and again you also heard him too look at how he you know one of the biggest questions of the offseason can Eric Comrie hand, handle the backup job he was asked about that by Mike McIntyre uh, I mean Paul Maurice was pretty resolute in his confidence in Eric Comrie not just the person but in Wade Flaherty saying this is a guy who has earned the opportunity to have the, you know, have a chance at showing he can do the job and he will be given that chance. I mean, how long will the, you know, how long will the chain be given? We'll, we'll see. But uh, this is a guy who's going to get the opportunity. We know that Connor Hellebuck, you know, provided all goes well for him, will be in that 60 to 65 game range once again. But Eric Comrie is going to have to give the Jets somewhere in that neighborhood of 20, 20 games. And that that is what is going to be required. And he's going to need to win at least 12 of those games in order for the Jets to, you know, command, remain competitive in the central division. So I think that's obviously one of the storylines we'll be looking forward to throughout the exhibition season. Paul Maurice touched on those battles on the periphery. It's not necessarily a bottom six role that's open, but I think you could say, you know, pretty confidently that, you know, the final three to five forward positions on this team are, uh, you know, I would say it's a bit of an open competition. I think Riley Nash, you can mark him down in pen, whether he's on, you know, potentially filling a Mason Appleton role on the third line with with Adam Lowry and Andrew Kopp, or if he's the fourth line center or the fourth line right winger. Well, he's on the team. So that leaves guys that we were on the ice today, the Christian Veselinans, David Gustafson, Evgeny Svechnikov, first look at him, uh, you know, some of the new guys, Austin Pognansky, uh, Luke Johnson, guys like that. Who's going to work themselves into the mix? Dominic Toninato was a hero in the playoffs. Is he going to be on the team or is he a depth guy with the Moose? I mean, there are still some pretty big question marks in terms of that forward grouping. And the one thing that stood out, Huss, I mean, it was mostly, you know, puck touches today and, you know, small area plays or, you know, the forwards were separate from the defense. And, you know, so you don't get a real great gauge of, you know, who's, you know, Know, blowing who out of the water but it was a lot of interest you know the one thing that stood two things really stood out the forward groups Huss, there's a lot of size even a guy like Svechnikov big strong guy that can skate Veselainen you know Cole Perfetti uh, you got guys who have a certain level of polish even though they're young players I mean Perfetti is a guy who looks like a polished uh, player uh, even though he only has those 32 games, I think, of pro experience. So uh, super interesting there. I mean, Veselainen really shooting it well. Gustafson, you know, see a guy like Jeff Malott, who I watched a couple times at the Moose last year. Those guys are on the ice kind of getting their bearings. And when it came to the defense, I mean, obviously this is a group that is super interesting as well because they have all this skating ability and skill on the backside when it comes to their prospect pool. You have Billy Hainala, you have a Declan Chisholm, who is an incredibly mobile individual. First glimpse at a Simon Lundmark, a guy who has played a couple of years pro already, even though this is his first chance over here uh, in North America. I thought he, you know, there's a certain level of poise that it, you know, even just, Again, you don't want to over-exaggerate because it's only drills. But for a lot of these guys, it's the substitution of what a development camp would have been. It's a little bit, you know, get get used to the verbiage. But, it, you know, just getting comfortable because, you know, a week from now, now some of these guys are going to be battling for jobs. There's not a ton of jobs open. 
right? We know this. I mean, Jansen Harkins is also probably a guy that you can mark down in pen also. But Paul Maurice talked about the possibility of Harkins being the fourth line center. I mean, for me, I think Gustafson is the fourth line center unless potentially he's moved into an Andrew Kopp role with Kopp and Lowry. I mean, I think I could see... I think Gustafson could be, because he's so smart, he has that big physical uh, frame, even though he's a pretty young, he's still a young guy. uh, He has that big, strong frame, but I think Gustafson is going to be the fourth line center, but I do see the potential for down the road. You could potentially have him in that role, but I think right now the Jets are leaning towards a Veselainen or Svechnikov on that right wing so that you have a little bit more of a natural finisher uh, and a shooter with those two guys that are have been so good in terms of the offensive zone time and chance creation. I mean, Sveshnikov is a guy who has really soft hands and tight hustle. You saw that on some of the small area plays today. He can really, he's got a heavy, heavy shot. Um, so to me, I, I think that, I'm not going to say it's a two-horse race, but those two guys would be the front runners if they're going with a skilled player, or a little bit more skilled player on that line. But when I heard Paul Maurice speak about Riley Nash and having him previously and how he really lauded him for his uh, defensive acumen and awareness, to me, the spider senses were tingling that maybe it's Riley Nash that could have the inside track on that Mason Appleton job uh, out of the gate. And again, I won't discount Jansen Harkins' opportunity for that as well. But the one thing I will say, Harkins has not played a lot on the right-hand side. And neither is Veselainen. He, he did a little bit last year, but he's been predominantly a left-wing player who's a left-shot a guy who has a big, you know, quick release and all of those things that we've seen at the American League level and that he's going to have to take to that next level. But Svechnikov's, you know, he's a little bit more of a natural right winger, so he's used to playing that offside. So I would say that could give him a bit of a leg up potentially in that race. But Riley Nash, I would not discount. I mean, I know he's not going to put up the same kind of offensive numbers as those guys could potentially do. But I could see him being definitely very much in the mix uh, for that job and that role as well. You brought up Svechnikov because he, mm-hmm. to me, is one of the most interesting players coming into camp because, of course, he doesn't have a contract right now with the Winnipeg Jets. Now, I, I do believe, I think, because of the cap situation, and I'll get your take on this, that, you know, they signed the Moose deal first. He'll be at camp, and I would think that there would be an opportunity to sign him after the season begins, uh, which would allow them to work those cap numbers a little bit more and get Brian Little onto LTIR and get that out. Um, but what's at stake for him right now? And when you look at him, you saw him today, you can tell us how he looked. I mean, where, if he's on the Winnipeg Jets, where would the fit be for Svechnikov in the lineup if he's in it? Yeah, for sure, Huss. And, and I do think it's just going to be a matter of time. I, I do see a two-way contract coming for uh, Evgeny Svechnikov there as well. And uh, in my reporting with uh, with Elliot Friedman there, I think that the, the PTO has already, you know, he'll be at camp. And I think it's just a matter of nailing down the specifics here and, uh, obviously, there was an injury situation that was, you know, he had had a sh- some, some issues with his shoulder cleaned up, I think, in the summertime. So uh, this was going to be around the time he was going to be ready. So I think there'll be a two-way deal coming uh, from the Winnipeg Jets as well. Uh, I mean, and again, these were they weren't running lines or whatever today, but they had Svechnikov, Veselainen, and then Perfetti sort of in a in a mixture on the on the on the groupings among the forwards. So I found that to be pretty interesting. Uh, could be a pretty interesting dynamic there as well. But yeah, for me, so Svechnikov could win a job on that third line right wing. Otherwise, he's got a battle for a fourth line job, and uh, that's another thing that Paul Maurice talked about. You know, you know, you're not going to necessarily see three grinders. Uh, on the fourth line this year. I mean, last year we know that uh, Matthew Perot, Nate Thompson and Trevor Lewis, when they were together had, you know, were very effective, didn't give up much in terms of the five on five game in terms of goals against. Uh, But, you know, there were two penalty killers in that, in that grouping, but you know, now Riley Nash is a guy that's going to be one of those guys who fills in for Appleton, Lewis and Thompson in that role. And I think Gustafson is another one, but Svechnikov has that ability to potentially be on a second power play unit because of his ability to shoot the puck. So he's either going to be a first line player with the Manitoba moose. And then, you know, he'll be a call up guy or else I really do think that he is in the mix for a roster spot, but again, he's going to have to have a great preseason. Uh, He's going to, you know, here's a guy who's getting a fresh start. He's, you know, 
19th overall selection in the draft in uh, 2015. But we know the Jets had him on the radar before Kyle Connor fell to them at 17. So they have some familiarity with the player. They obviously liked him. We know he's had some junior hockey success in the queue with Pierre-Luc Dubois. I don't think he was brought in to play with Dubois. Dubois is going to have other line mates in the top six. But I think Svechnikov is, I think he's one of the most in- intriguing players to me in the entire training camp because of that high-end potential. And it's like you mentioned, it right now it's a zero risk move. He doesn't even have an NHL deal, but I think that's just a matter of time. And here's a guy that, you know, would be very motivated to show that he he's not only going to be an NHL player, but that he can become a regular and a contributor because you know, that just didn't happen for him. He had some injuries in Detroit and things didn't go quite as smoothly. But uh, this is a guy that has a lot of high-end potential. I mean, you don't get drafted 19th overall if you don't have a skill set that projects, you know, to be an NHL player. So uh, he'll be a guy that I could see him playing in, you know, four to six of the, you know, four or five of the preseason games. And he, it's going to get sorted out that way. And I mean, obviously, too, I mean, we talked about Perfetti. Perfetti is also a guy, like, could Cole Perfetti in his first full NHL training camp or first full pro camp of any kind be in that Mark Shifley 2011 situation, right? I'm not going to say that he can't, of course he can. I mean, but it's up to him to play the game. I mean, Cole Perfetti, like every other high end prospect said his goal is to make the team. Of course that's his goal. That has to be his goal or else you have zero chance of making the team. Uh, Does he have a legitimate shot of making the jets and sticking around beyond the nine games? Well, we don't know. I mean, I don't think Paul Maurice could tell you today. He doesn't want to go out and say, put him in pen today. Of course not. But if he has a training camp similar to what Shifley did in 2011, of course he's going to stick around to start the year and see what happens. But um, you can't you know, can't put the cart before the, before, before the horse. I mean, we always want to look into the crystal ball and see what we project. And I think Cole Perfetti is getting games with the NHL team this year. Does that mean they're in October? Does that mean they're in February? I mean, Cole Perfetti will determine April when when Cole Perfetti is ready. And sure, I mean, Cole Caulfield was brought up as an example. And Paul Maurice was very quick to point out that, yes, Cole Caulfield did a great job with the Montreal Canadiens, but he's a year advanced and that was at the end of a year. So you're basically looking at a two year difference in windows uh, when you're looking at October versus you know, coming in, in in April, May and having a big role in the playoffs with the Montreal Canadiens. So they're obviously different players, but they're they're dynamic in their own ways. And Cole Perfetti, the ability to have Cole Perfetti potentially play for the Manitoba Moose rather than go back to the Ontario Hockey League Total as a 19-year-old Total is game changer. absolutely a game changer. Like I, like, I don't know about you, Ken, but I mean, I really thought that if that rule wasn't, you know, wasn't instituted, I thought there was a good chance that he'd be on the team all year because I don't really know what the benefit would have been other than playing a lot, um, but in a league that he's already done very well in and has been playing at a much higher level. But now with the American Hockey League option just down the hall, uh, especially with the way he played in the second half of the season with the Manitoba Moose, it makes too much sense. I mean, unless there's a real need up front for the Winnipeg Jets due to injury or whatever, very similarly to Billy Hanel and Dylan Sandberg, to get down there to play 20 plus minutes a night, to play in all situations, and to be ready for what the role that they will need to fill when they get the call up to the Winnipeg Jets, because it's not going to be playing six minutes a night with a couple checkers on the fourth line. No, exactly. And I, like, I'll use the Nick Patan example uh, just because, you know, similar body type or Don't whatever else. Don't compare him to Patan. People are going to lose it. <laughs> no, I, this, I'm just saying here, I'm not comparing him to Patan, but I'm comparing the situations. And here's yeah. the thing. the One of the issues would happen with Patan is that because he's, you know, the Jets tried this experiment out where you have a skilled player, smallish skilled player on the fourth line where he would play in the second power play. But... The big difference was that when you start him there, instead of starting him in the minors, where he plays the 20 minutes a game, gets all the puck touches, is on the first power play and feeling confident, when Nick Patan was playing six minutes a night, you didn't have that confidence, right? I mean, so the Jets don't want to run the risk of having Cole Perfetti on the fourth line playing six to eight minutes a night and not getting any puck touches. If Cole Perfetti can either, you know, whether they stretch out the top nine or if you even, I can even see a scenario where you played Perfetti with Lowry and Kopp because of his elite hockey sense and awareness. So, I mean, no, he's not a defensive player, but he could play with those guys because he's smart enough to play with them. But I think the best, again, this Cole Perfetti's not going to want to hear this, nor does nor should he be listening to it on you know September 16th. But 
I think he's in the chat right now, actually. What's that? He's in the chat right now, well, actually. He just wished you happy birthday. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is again, this is the benefit of experience having covered the American Hockey League for 10 years and now the Amer- now the National Hockey League for 10 years. A guy in Cole Perfetti's situation, unless he's going to play ba- major minutes in the National Hockey League, he will be best suited for his long-term development to be a 20-minute-a-game player with the Manitoba Moose centering the top line, whoever that has on it. Um, again, he, I don't I don't want that to be his mindset going into training camp, but I'm going to help look into the crystal ball for when the opening night roster is made. And, and Cole Perfetti may steal a job, but if he's not going to play a you know, significant number of minutes, the best place for him is in the American Hockey League, getting to a place where he dominates. And then it, when a need arises, he comes up and, and can s- slide right in, feeling confident. Let's not forget, Cole Perfetti came an incredible you know, amount of time in terms of his development last year. Uh, that is an opportunity that's not ne- not almost ever afforded to an 18 year old individual. Certainly not a CHL player uh, would not be allowed to do he that. He won the but, pandemic. I mean, yeah, everyone he, else got screwed. Cole Perfetti was the one guy that absolutely benefited from the situation and even more so now having that op- opportunity to play in the A as opposed to if he's not going to be in the lineup, end up going to junior for the entire season. Absolutely. And and he knows exactly what he needs to get better at. That's the beauty of Cole Perfetti. He knows that in order to become an NHL regular and a top six player, which is what he projects to be and will be uh, in due time, has to work in his skating, getting stronger. But there's always that balance, that whole getting stronger versus, you know, keeping your speed and, you know, getting, you know, getting faster. Like it's not getting bulkier, it's getting faster and all those things streamlining and everything else. But Perfetti is a guy who's, who understands the situation and he also understands the mentality that's required i mean even if in his own head he knows that maybe he's probably most likely going to be with the manitoba moose that's not the mentality you take into nhl camp you want to make it as difficult as possible for the coaching staff and the and the management staff to send him to junior if you're cole perfetti you're trying to steal a job and win a job and that's what he absolutely will be trying to do but to me i just think it's most likely that he will end up as a first line player with the manitoba moose at the outset that doesn't mean that he's not ready to help you in february march april may or june but it means that it's most likely and the thing that the back to the original premise of nick patan i think the problem with starting patan in the nhl at that time was he felt he was an nhl player because he started the year in october in the nhl so you know, if you start in the American Hockey League, of course, there's going to be disappointment at the beginning. Yes, you know, it sucks to be cut, whatever else. But if you start with that mentality and then all of a sudden you build, 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 and when you come up once, you may stay there forever. It's different than if you spend two or three months um, and then all of a sudden now you're sort of having to have that five to 10 day period where you're maybe feeling sorry for yourself that you're not in the NHL anymore. Cole Perfetti knows the American Hockey League is a good league. He just played in the American Hockey League and he played well, but it wasn't an easy, easy, it wasn't easy street for Cole Perfetti in the first half of the year. It was tough at five on five because he was undersized and he had to use all of his tools in the toolbox to have success. But because he's so smart and because he's so talented and because his vision allows other people to get to great spots, he went from being, you know, a guy who was kind of treading water in the first half at five on five to becoming a dominant player. I mean, is he going to win every board battle with a 240 pound defenseman? No, of course not. But he's smart enough to leverage a guy that he can win that battle once in a while and he'll continue to get good at those things. But to me, I just think it'll be super interesting. I mean, you know, Svechnikov, super intriguing to me. How Perfetti fits and, you know, does he get all six games? I think he's going to get four to six exhibition games. Paul Marie said it today. His veterans are going to spend the majority of their time scrimmaging. They're probably going to play in two of the three home games. Maybe they get that last road game against Calgary. Uh, but we'll see what happens in terms of the numbers game. But if you're if you're a guy on the periphery of the roster and you're trying to win a job, you're going to be playing four times minimum. And a lot of those guys are going to play all six. And that's what you want to see. Uh, how's it going to work out on the back end? I mean, Billy Hanela as a guy that, of course, he's one of those guys that I talk about. He, you, you have that setting like you have today. Billy Hanela is going to stand out every single time because of his mobility, even if you're just doing simple drills. But his his hand skills and his puck skills and his brain 
will always stand out. So, I mean, it, he me also, the you, thing, the thing, one, one quick one, one, okay. Just right. handle it. He doesn't look like a kid anymore, right? Two years ago, he looked like a guy, you know, and he was 18 when he first came in, right? Here's a guy who's starting to fill out. He's maturing. Uh, and again, he needs to dominate at the American League level, most likely. But, you know, can, is six games enough to steal a job on the NHL roster? Well, we'll see. If they're dominant, the Jets may have, have no choice. But right now, he would be in that Cole Perfetti category where he's going to have to be basically be head and shoulders above because you're not going to keep Billy Hanel as the seventh defenseman because he no. needs to be playing. So that's okay, though. But I so think it's, it, it provides a super interesting opportunity. And then, too, Dylan Sandberg speaking today. I mean, if you're Dylan Sandberg, uh, the arrival of Brennan Dillon isn't great for you because you went from potentially being Neil Pionk's defense partner to now being Billy Hanel's defense partner, or maybe you're playing him again with Johnny Kovacevic with the Manitoba Moose because they had such great success last year. But it's tough for a guy like Sandberg. But let's not forget, Huss, this is always the beauty. The beauty of the history lesson is always nearby. Not one single individual had Logan Stanley in the Game 2 lineup for the Winnipeg Jets last year, right? When we went into the training camp in January, not one person, not even the staunchest Logan Stanley supporter had Logan Stanley in the lineup. He could potentially be on the team but it took a couple of injuries and a COVID bout for Tucker Pullman to get Logan Stanley into the lineup. But once he got into the lineup, he showed he was a lot further along than most people expected. So can Dylan Sandberg or Vili Hanela do that this October or September? Of course they could. Well, they can. But, but listen, I don't think that's going to happen. And I think right. we've got a pretty solid six. We pretty sure. much, you know, read the room, guys. I mean, and with the salaries, hey, you've got Bolio uh, and you've got Sammy Niku, who are probably best suited to be that extra guy. Meanwhile, with these young men playing the 20 plus minutes a night, but I'll yeah. ask you this, and I was going to get this, but I'm glad you brought up Sandberg because he's part and parcel of it. I think Perfetti's a little different, but those two in particular, who I think many people agree are ready to go and could be contributing in the National Hockey League right now, is the biggest challenge going to be for the new moves coaching staff and for the organization to keep these guys in good spirits and motivated going forward, considering the fact that it's pretty clear right now that the path to playing in the Jets lineup right now, if everyone's healthy, is a bit of a long shot. And that means back to the American League. Yeah, it's totally a fair point, Huss. And, and that's the other part, too. Like, my 10 years of covering the American League were super valuable because you see the different, uh, you know, mentalities required whether it was a first round pick getting sent down or it was an undrafted free agent a guy like a jason jaffrey or or someone like that who went you know went from east coast league player to nhl player uh of course you know would you rather be have you know cashing an nhl paycheck and you know hanging out at the ritz carlton on your off days of course you would anyone would want that instead of riding around on the buses of course but you got to focus on the, you know, that's short-sighted view. The long view is that these guys are both going to be National Hockey League defensemen. Is it going to be in three months or six months or, you know, 12 months? I mean, I don't know that. Neither do they. But things happen quickly. You know, one injury and those guys are ready, right? That's the other part. So you can't afford to go down and dog it in the American League because you're feeling sorry for yourself because you think you're a National Hockey League player. And I don't think that either one of those players would do that. I think that both of them have very strong mentalities. I mean, was was it last year tough on Vili Hanela? Of course it was. But he still played, I think, around 50 games of hockey when you count all the experiences. So he still had a good year in terms of progress. Dylan Sandberg, is this the way he envisioned things after leaving as a junior from the University of Minnesota Duluth? Of course not. He thought he'd be in the NHL this year most likely. But right now that opportunity or that pathway seems to be a little bit, you know, if it's not blocked completely, there are some obstacles he's going to have to overcome in order to reach that goal immediately. But it's very simple, Huss. And again, the experience of covering the minors and you were around the minors for a long time Absolutely. in your job with the Manitoba Moose. Things change very quickly. And if you're not ready, somebody else is going to be ready to take that job. So I think that both these guys – the best advice for any player in that situation, forward, defenseman, goaltender, anything. You always think you're ready. You know, same as coaching. You know, a lot of coaches in the American League thought they were ready to not only be NHL coaches, but be successful and dominant NHL coaches. Guess what? The best thing you can do for your life and your life career and your future success is to have success currently. Just be invested in wherever you are. Play the best hockey that you can. And guess what? 
When you're a dominant player, you get noticed and you get promoted. No matter how many people are ahead of you currently on the depth chart, it's just the way that it goes. I mean, we talked about Nick Batan earlier. Same goes for Kyle Connor. Did Kyle Connor want to be playing in the American League after leaving Michigan as a freshman? Of course not. But I would argue to you, Huss, that after watching Kyle Connor in the first two months of the year, nobody benefited more than Kyle Connor going down and dominating and becoming a 20 plus goal scorer at the Manitoba Moose at the American Hockey League level. Without that time, would yeah, Kyle but those Connor guys still... had that time last year? I mean, I guess no, that's yeah. the point. Like, this is now round two for these guys um, after yeah, doing thing... all that. Connor had four games and then he was back and he never looked back, right? Right, for sure. But the other part, too, like Sandberg is only one year removed from college. So, and then it was a shortened season. So, I would say I understand that you want to be there quickly. And he's not a young, you know, young, young guy, like coming out of, you know, 20 year old coming out of, coming out of junior. And anally, of course, it's frustrating. You played in league already. You probably, you know, you felt you're ready two years ago. Of course, of course you're going to feel like you're ready now. But the best thing you can do is dominate at whatever level you're at. And then your opportunity is going to come, whether it's through injury, trade, or whatever else. We know these guys are good players. We know that they are valued by the organization. And their opportunities are going to be right around the corner. Are they going to come as quickly as they had hoped they might? Uh, that doesn't look to be the case. But... Um, I don't think you'll see a lot of wallowing or self-pity from any of those three players that we talked about. And I think that they could be part of what could be a really, that's the other thing from watching today. The Manitoba Moose last year were more of a, uh, you know, workman like uh, work boots type of team that out outworked and had great goaltending. They have a lot of skilled defensemen. They have some size obviously as well. Sam Brink being one of those guys who plays mean and has a physical edge to his game also. But uh, there are some talented people that are going to be playing for the Manitoba Moose as well. And uh, provided they get good goaltending, which we expect them to have with the groupings that they have. And there was the other part to me, Huss. I mean, man, you walk into the rink at the Iceplex today and you look at who's on the ice. You watch Ar- like Arvid Holm is a monster. Like He's like a six foot four. Uh, he looks like you know he takes up a lot of net. Like Of course, he's going to have to adapt to the North American game. But he's had two really solid seasons previously. So he's a guy that's going to be intriguing to watch. Is he going to be in the American League? Uh, I mean, with DeRoche being added, uh, man, I mean... Could one of those guys end up in the East Coast League in the ECHL? I'm I'm not sure, but uh, they're going to be fun to watch. The the, the Moose roster right now, I mean, if you're a fan of the Moose and, you know, go to a lot of those games, I think we're going to see one of the best squad, maybe the best squad that we've had, at least on paper, um, since the Moose came back to Winnipeg. I'm looking at a few of the chest hurt. Yeah, Connor did play a full season in the AHL, but then, yeah, yeah, remember, man. he got sent back down at the beginning of the next season. That was a big yeah, disappointment. Four played yeah. four games, came up got thrown on, on the top line and never and never uh, never looked back. Um but Ken just you first of all take a deep breath and hydrate because this next question could get you going <laughs> okay, for big a little one. while. Um as far as those players go considering the situation if things go well if this if let's just assume it's the top 4 it's DeMello it's Stanley and those guys are relatively healthy and play well going forward and the Jets are a playoff team that you know feel like they have a real shot to win. What are the chances that one of those players, Hanela or Sandberg, in your mind, is traded before the end of the season? Yeah, it's interesting, Huss. Obviously, it's something that you, if, you're, if you're Kevin Chevalier, if you got pretty nice chip, pretty nice, you, you got to be to listening. Have. Those are those are good things to have, and that because of the aforementioned depth on the back end that I've discussed, and you know, I didn't even mention Leon Gavanka, who's going to be playing in the Olympics for Germany. So he's a guy that you know. He, we often talk about you know the Jets' right side doesn't have the same. I mean, it doesn't have the same amount of depth at the NHL level, but you still have kind of some depth guys. And, you know, you have a Nelson Noje, you have a Johnny Kovacevic, you have a Leon Gavank, and now you have a Simon Lundmark. I mean, I would say that if you're looking at your right side depth, that seems like pretty good depth. I mean, not in terms of NHL experience per se, but in terms of guys that you might be able to plug and play, or you could envision a spot for them to be playing in those jobs down the road. So, could those guys be moved? I mean, of course they could, but I, I don't think that Kevin Sheveldayoff is on the phone saying, you know what, I'd really like to get rid of one of these guys right now. But, I mean, if it if the Jets are, you know, one of the leading teams in the Central Division or in the Western Conference, and they they see an opportunity to add a player they think that could put them over the edge, would those guys be in play? Well, that depends on the level of player. But uh, I don't see... 
I, it's not a slam dunk that one or the other will be gone at the deadline for me, Huss. Oh, but yeah, of course, no. it, and I know you're not suggesting that, but what you are saying is exactly right. Of course, those are chips that could get you the type of player, you know, let's look no further than the 2017-18 season. I mean, would one of those players be in the, you know, kind of get you the type of Paul Stastny level player at 2018 to help try to push a team over the top? Of course. And there's going to be a lot of teams around the NHL whose budgets will be impacted by COVID. We know all 32 teams have been impacted by COVID, even Seattle, before even playing a game. Whether that's off-ice business, on-ice business, trying to fill rinks, any of those things. Some budgets will be slashed, and when budgets are slashed, that means either expensive players or some really good players in that middle tier become available to other teams. So, Look no further than the Arizona Coyotes, right? I mean, they're, you know, Christian Dueling <laughs> to the Coyotes could be helped by Christian Dvorak. Of course they could. But if you're rebuilding and potentially tanking, of course you're going to take the draft picks and move Dvorak over to the Montreal Canadiens, right? So um, there will be teams like that and teams get off to slow starts. All of a sudden, certain players are loose and available. Paul Stastny, again, is a great example. No one thought Paul Stastny was available. The St. Louis Blues were a contending team. And Paul Stastny had been a guy who was part of their core leadership group. All of a sudden, he was available at the right price. So, of course, yeah. uh, I mean, the cap situation is definitely fluid. I mean, we talked about it before, Huss. The Jets could be rolling with a 21 and 22 man roster. They're going to have to be hoping for a lot of health in order to leave some space available to even potentially make an impact move yeah. at the deadline because of their LTIR situation. But, uh, of course, you know, that's the other part, Huss. You talked about it earlier. You can't be going down and pout if you're in the minors. If if you're not going to be on the Jets, if you're Vili Hanela, you're auditioning for 31 other teams, right? Same for Dylan Sandberg. And that that's not the initial mindset, but anytime any player at the pro level steps on the ice, your first responsibility is to your own team. But if you're trying to change your situation, nobody wants to nobody wants to trade for somebody who is not in a good place mentally and yeah. isn't giving it everything that they have. We know those guys are skilled. We know that they're talented. We know they're going to be HO players, but uh, the mental test is all often important as the physical side of things. And I think that all those players will flourish uh, even if those end up being their circumstances and circumstances that they would prefer to avoid. Well, and, and, and listen, it's not in the Jets MO to be trading top prospects before no. they get an opportunity in the NHL. But I, I, the reason I bring this up is that, you know, there is, I think heightened expectations of what this club can do. You add in the thing is the additions of Dylan and Schmidt along with I mean, your top five defensemen right now, all are signed for three more years. Yeah. I mean, if these guys are there and are in the lineup and Logan Stanley's part of it, I mean, at some point something's got to give. And, you know, as I said, it just gets to the point where if this team is a contender and there is someone out there that, you know, they could add, um, as opposed to going down the first round pick route, I mean, you may have two NHL ready defensemen that could very well play in your lineup right now, but essentially you can't play eight guys in a game. You can only play six. And uh, it, it's very interesting and such a different conversation we're having, Ken, as opposed to the last couple of years where people are wondering, you know, can they get six legit NHL defensemen in the lineup after the exodus from the right side a couple of years ago? Yeah, and that's the other part to really keep in consideration uh, for the fan base. Uh, you have to have guys like that in reserve that you can plug and play in case of injury, in case of, you know, especially now during a pandemic, in case of COVID, even if you know the majority of the Jets are already vaccinated. So COVID's not going away, and there are other situations and circumstances that arise. So you, any team that wants to win, you're going 8 to 10 deep on the back end. So if you have a couple NHL, you know, overbaked and ready players or over ripened players that are ready to go. You don't necessarily, you're not going to be handing those away uh, for anything. And you also remember for the Jets scenario, because those guys that you you mentioned Schmidt and Dylan are under contract for three and four years themselves. You need guys on ELC contracts to fill some of those other roster spots. So the value of that is immense for Kevin Shevel Dayoff, who is already at a, as going to be a cap ceiling team once again. So uh, I think that, you know, even though the players might want to be in the NHL, those players are, are are equally valuable within the organization for what they bring, both in terms of their skill sets and abilities, but also the contracts that they certainly are currently under right now. So I, I don't see any of them, 
you know, going anywhere. I, I wouldn't say there's no chance they'll be moved, but uh, it would take a elite level player with term in order for those guys to kind of be in the deal. Cause let's just look back no further than last trade deadline when the jets were interested in the likes of Ekholm, Alexiak, Josh Manson, all of those guys. Of course, the G- other GM is asking for guys like, like we're talking about Hanel and Sandberg, but the Jets are were not in a, were not in a rush to move those guys then, and they won't be in a rush to move them now either. But of course, yeah. they have a little bit more flexibility, uh, having a you know full I mean, back end and defense core that is uh, you know revamped and 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 readily improved. Exactly. I mean, before Brendan Dillon and Nate Schmidt came to town, I mean, I think many of us thought that barring any other you know changes, that these guys would be in those spots. They're not there right now. And that's why it's such an interesting conversation to have right now. Man, we're just a day into mini camp and we're getting these sort of takes from you. You were all those all that time on the golf course. You were just sitting there coming up with takes for the first time return to Winnipeg Sports Talk. This was uh this was a lot of fun, Ken. People were loving it. It was uh Long overdue, and uh, man, it's great to have uh, the team back, and it'll be really get interesting next year when uh, we've got the whole squad getting after it. And then, man, we got exhibition games in like ten days. You gotta love it, Huss. Always, always a pleasure to share the microphone uh, and the stage with you, and uh, we'll look forward to many of these conversations over the course of the season. Yeah, I, I, I saw that you were uh, out golfing with your partner Rennie there. What, uh, <laughs> what's the, uh, what's the ETA on uh, a little Kenny and Rennie content? What's going on? Give us an update. Yeah, we're still uh, we're still finalizing uh, all of those details, Huss. But uh, you're basically working on Randy to say, "Come on, let's go." It's quite obvious. That it's very, <laughs> eminently obvious that you're ready to go at any time. The mics are turned on. Yes, you know that is the case. But uh, no, Sean's ready to go. Also, we're just trying to work through some of the. You know, there's all kinds. You know, he's a he's a parent, so uh, he's got to uh, got to be worried about where the kids are at and everything else. But. Uh, the school pickups and the schedulings, but we're definitely uh, we're going to be piggybacking uh, your show again on a few uh, occasions for sure during the course of the year, and uh, it'll be a stay tuned situation. But uh, <laughs> sooner than later, there's no doubt about that. Oh my God, this has been so much fun. Uh, the people have loved it. Uh, some amazing, amazing comments in the chat. Yes, T. Will, you're right. I guess I do have to get back to work now. Here, uh, this was uh, this was awesome, pal. Uh, well, listen, stay in touch. Obviously, uh, when you guys know that uh, you're on, we'll let everybody know here, and uh, we'll get you guys on beforehand to uh, to tee it up. And uh, hopefully, we can do this on the reg coming up this season. Yeah, beautiful man. Uh, have a great rest of the day, rest of the week, and we will uh, speak again soon. Excellent. Thanks so much. There he is. Weeb's World back on WST. What a great segment that was. And that's just the first day of minicamp for the Winnipeg Jets. Great thanks to uh, to Ken for doing it.